Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I got, a, I got plenty going on, which sort of means I don't have time to go into it all. Um, but partly because I've, I've got three pod guests to prepare for between this Thursday and Monday, which is um, a time frame that's also going to include flying to London in advance of a, a pharma conference I've got in Frankfurt next week. So, um, well, the upside is if I get through the next week with some good conversations, I will be in really good shape to finish out 2022. Weird as that sounds, because um, I got a bunch of guests lined up for the next six weeks after this. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of weird to think of finishing 2022 in October. It's almost November, but still, um, I've already got a bunch of people lined up for 23. And um, God, I'm just going to keep going doing this, aren't I? Anyway, let's get to this week's show. Uh, my guest this time is Daryl Pinckney, who was on around two years ago for a, a pair of his essay collections. This time, Daryl has a brand new memoir out, which he referred to back then. Uh, it's called Come Back in September, A Literary Education on West 67th Street, Manhattan. It's from FSG, and it is an absolute wonder of a book. Um, Daryl's going to talk about the major threads of the book at the, the very beginning of the, the conversation, so I'll try to keep it relatively brief. Come Back in September is about Daryl's life um, as a writer and and as a new New York City habitué from, uh, well, throughout the 70s. Um, it's centered on his his friendship with and apprenticeship to uh, the writer Elizabeth Hardwick, who he studies with at Columbia. Um, and he really, he really brings her to life. Um, her, her, her writing process, her, her conversation, her relationships with other writers and, and editors, her, her complex personal life and her, her joy in turning him on to, to new writers and books and, and so many more aspects of, of what goes into a, a life, particularly a literary one, as, as he puts it. And throughout th or through their relationship, Daryl gets exposed to, to all of these these great literary figures like the New York Review of Books editors, Barbara Epstein and, and Bob Silver, and writers like Susan Sontag and, and Mary McCarthy, and Hardwick's ex-husband, the poet Robert Lowell. Um, see, at, at the same time as this, at the same time he's, he's sort of being introduced into this literary world, Daryl and his contemporaries, uh, Luke Sant, uh, Felice Rosser, Howard Bruckner, and, and, and others, like Jim Jarmusch, are carving out their own scenes in New York's new wave culture. Um, and then you, you, well, you take those two worlds and you take Daryl's upbringing and, and background. He's, he's black and gay and raised in Indianapolis by parents who were active in the civil rights movement. And you, you get a, a perspective. You get someone who has enough of a distance to, to view these worlds with fresh eyes, basically. But, but you also get someone who's clearly trying to find his place. And, and developing as an artist and writer um, and as a person in, in this, this whole series of worlds of, of this 1970s New York. And the coming of age narrative of the book, it's, well, it, it's all the more joyous because it's a golden age Daryl's coming into. We, we talk about that, uh, whether he knew it was a golden age at the time, because he really gets across the, the, the intellectual ferment of, of what was taking place in that era and the, the conflicts and rivalries and, and, and the cattiness and, and deep respect of, of these writers and, and, you know, cultural commentators. 
And he also brings in the, the, that frantic nature of the avant-garde, the, 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 the nightlife he was living, uh, along with, you know, his, his times with Hardwick. He's also got all this, these club scenes and attempts at scoring in, in various ways, shapes and forms. Um, it, it really is something. And along the way or throughout, he's, he's really chronicling his own development as a writer and as a reader, especially, you know, in terms of establishing his, his place at the New York Review of Books and, and learning the value of great editors like Epstein and, and Silvers. And the other part of the book, the thing we don't really get into in the conversation, but the thing I found really, really fascinating was... Hardwick's relationship to to Robert Lowell, the 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 poet, and and the betrayal of their divorce, his 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 affair, and later marriage to uh, Caroline Blackwood, who has a Lucian Freud connection, which ties back into other guests of mine in in the past here, um, but also the horrible thing Lowell does, among many horrible things in terms of what divorce always entails, but using some of Elizabeth Hardwick's letters in poems that he would write in the collection The Dolphin, and not specifying which of those poems are using her letters and which aren't, even though things are attributed sort of to her voice. And, well, it's just a really awful, awful thing to do. Um, and and Daryl Daryl goes into those those. Uh, experiences of what it was like for Elizabeth, what it was like for him trying to, to be her friend throughout this. And well, I'll say this, Come Back in September is a, it's a really lovely testament to friendship on top of, of the literary education and the cultural scenes and everything else. The very core of it is the affection these two people have for each other, but also the limits of, of what we can do for the, the people we love. Now, I've, I've talked about my affinity for sort of writing about bygone literary New York City in, in the past, like uh, uh, the memoirs of Frederick Tutton and Bruce J. Friedman and Ben Sonnenberg. Um, this one is no exception to that rule, even though it's a different era, a different literary New York, and the writer is a different background, and he's he's talking about a different set of figures. He's still... Well, he evokes a, a time when, when writing really mattered. Plus, the book's got a ton of literary gossip and insults and cattiness, like I mentioned, which makes it an awful lot of fun. But anyway, I enjoyed the living heck out of Come Back in September. It really is a, a I'll say, illuminating portrait of, of, of that New York. And again, of, of when the culture was, was being created in a time that, you know, now, well, again, we, we can all go into, you know, the static nature of today. But anyway, go give it a read. Come back in September from Farrar Strauss Garo. Uh, comes out today, October 25th, 2022, for you time travelers out there. Um, now, as far as caveats go, uh, we did this one in person. So, you know, usual noise in the background because it's New York City. Um, if you are ever confused during the conversation when Daryl refers to she or her, just assume it's Elizabeth Hardwick. Um, that is uh, invariably who it's going to be in reference to. When he mentions James, uh, that is Daryl's partner, the writer uh, James Fenton. And when he mentions Marina, it is Marina Warner, who I will be recording with in London uh, on Halloween. Uh, Daryl connected us, and I mentioned that I have her new memoir on my shelf anyway. So, um, well, anyway, he's, he's just going to bring that right into the conversation. The one thing I forgot to ask him while we were recording, uh, I did ask him afterwards when he was signing a copy of the book to me, and we were busy making outrageous statements about various writers, uh, none of which I will share with you. Um, I asked him, do you ever go by Elizabeth Hardwick's home on West 67th since her death? You know, it, she died uh, in 2007, I think, because um, I just wondered whether the place itself meant anything to him, at least from the outside or the neighborhood or whatever. And he says he doesn't, um, but that's not out of avoidance, just convenience. Um if you're going to go to Lincoln Center, you don't really pass by that, that you know, street or neighborhood at all. So anyway, um, that's just something I, I 
felt I should share with you guys because it's one thing that I really meant to, to ask him on tape. But oh, uh, also, he drums his fingers on the table uh, a couple of times. I didn't want to make him self-conscious and, and stop doing it. But you're going to hear that sort of rumbling and rattling. Uh, anyway, here's Daryl's bio from the book. Daryl Pinckney is the author of the novels Black Deutschland and High Cotton and the nonfiction works Busted in New York and Other Essays, Blackballed, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy, and Out There, Mavericks of Black Literature. His new book is Come Back in September. And now, the 2022 Virtual Memories Conversation with Daryl Pinckney. So I, I, I promised in 2020 that if you put out another book, uh, we would do this in person next time. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually here. The thing I want to ask to start is when we spoke about your, your new book, at the time you said maybe it's about too many things when you started describing it. Having read it now, I believe come back in September is about too many things in a wonderful, wonderful way. Uh, you know, it, 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 I was holding on by the, the seat of my pants at various points, but enjoying the living hell out of the, the whole thing. Tell me about the book. Tell me about the, the It's not origin. about too many things. It's yeah. Elizabeth Hardwick. Yeah. And from that comes the review. Uh, and people I know through the review, peers and revered figures. Um, there's family, and from that you could connect um, certain traditions in black thought from Reconstruction, and that sort of has a connection to black literature at the time. Um, uh, you know, it's the black literature I talk about. It, it's meant to have be part of this family story, this black family story that's um, in contrast to the uh, review Elizabeth Hardwick Strain and then the other thing is downtown uh, and this life is a young person and that has two parts one is the new wave life with my straight friends and the other one is the sort of gay bar life with gay friends. So they're really just three things. It's, you know, Black, The New York Review, Downtown. Yeah. Although in a particularly... <laughs> it just, it's in the diary <laughs> format. Yeah. It just, you know, it is full of incident yeah. and people. A lot of a, a lot of people who I have either gotten to know or have read from, you know, the previous generation uh, of people with a, this great sort of lineage li yes. uh, uh, literarily. Yeah. Um, I will say it's also taking place in a period of history, the very, very late sixties through the eighties that is consequential. We'll put it that way. I mean, yeah. just saying it's about the New York, you know, and, and downtown scene, uh, I don't want to say it leads over, but, you know, it includes the AIDS era, which, you know, rapidly... Stops. Just stops there. Yeah. Stops in 81. Yeah. Uh, because, yes, <clears throat> uh, the next summer, uh, this kind of fear was beginning to grip uh, not just uh, the gay scene downtown, but the new wave scene as well, since... Um, Drug users, drug users were also at risk, and often there was a lot of overlap mm -hmm. uh, between the two. So I wanted to stop at a moment of promise. And yet, throughout the book, you have the the parentheticals where where contemporary Daryl, <laughs> you know, speaks up about you know either this person died or you know James just happened to mention that or not happened. James just told me that you know this poem was written by X. You know, talk about the the way you you wrote the book. You know what the the how you saw it structurally and how you saw it. You know, in terms of the mechanics of. of well, it's meant to go chronologically until the letters and journals at the end, which are arranged by person. That is to say, thematically, mm -hmm. uh, and then chronologically after at the very end because of the way the deaths fall. Um, it goes from sort of 73 to 81. There's very little 
reference to anything that occurs beforehand except in a general way of her history, Elizabeth Hardwick's history, or my upbringing. Uh, it follows this kind of... I actually just went through my old journals and transcribed, which is why there's still some mistakes mm-hmm. <laughs> here and there of a grievous nature and, and just facts. For instance, it wasn't Foucault who gave the lecture on masturbation in the 17th century. It was Lacan. And Lucy Sant's not from Cherry Hill. She's from Murray Hill, mm-hmm. um, which if I got up and looked again at the factory of facts, I would have corrected. But I just went through my journals and I didn't really consult anything else. Uh, um, not, not really. What did you learn? What did I learn? Yeah. What about the, the, the writing, the research? What did it? Well, I, I, there were, me? you know, things I'd not looked back on ever. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it was a struggle to, um, separate what you were finding out from what you needed. Uh, you know, this confrontation with your old self is a bit too much, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, I leave out a great deal. I have to, just to protect myself, you know, this absolute fool. (laughs) (laughs) When we last spoke, we talked about our physical response and revulsion to shame decades after a a shameful act and a minor shameful act. And nonetheless, each of us or both of us will, you know, just cringe or 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 try. Yeah. And then also at the time in this time of, um, you know, Whatever, there's a lot of sort of description of what one got up to that perhaps is less interesting or not as radical as it seemed at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of emotion about people and sort of relationships and things like that. N- none of it is particularly uh, interesting from my side. Um, and so I had to kind of just put myself in the frame to make sure I kind of melted into the frame so that the things that mattered to me in doing this uh, could stand out uh, more. So it's remembering my family at uh, you know, a time when actually things began to go badly for us. It took, took a while, but it certainly was hitting downhill or hits downhill through, this, through the memoir. And... Um, I wanted to remember Elizabeth Hardwick, uh, you know, as as a writer. So a lot of other stuff is left out, you know, uh, that she may have talked about or been going through. Um, I stick to what she talked about in literary matters mostly or in relation to Lowell. Um, um, you know, just to remember... Hardwick and her friends as these intelligent women, and not sort of, I don't know, poor Susan Sontag is her own worst enemy. As soon as she says something, you can't believe she said it. But yeah. uh, I remember how strongly uh, the New York Review and Lizzie and Barbara felt that as much as they knocked Susan, they really minded it. When other people did, they always defended her to the larger public uh, because, you know, she was our Susan was their feeling. Uh, And they they valued her uh, as (laughs) off the wall as she could be. You know, it's Uh, funny in the book, she's a, a sort of shadow presence throughout yeah. until that final section where she becomes much more directly prominent in your life. Yeah. And these journal entries about, you know, your interactions become... But she becomes fuller, still yes. incredibly flawed in, in, you know, all the, the ways that you characterize through the, the book. But you get a, a more of a sense of her as a person as it goes on. Well, we didn't really get to be friends until a bit later. Uh, the part of the the part that the book's not about, it stops in 1981 and then the epilogue is in 1989. Um, partly because this new life and Lizzie comes to Germany and Susan comes to Germany, and I'm on the phone with Barbara, but also uh, because of of the people who die in 1989. Yeah. Um, 
and they represent these particular subjects or themes of the book. Sterling is family and black literature, and uh, Jonathan Lieberson and Virgil Thompson are the review, and that kind of past, and um, Howard is downtown and that gay life, and Mary McCarthy is, um, you know, Lizzie's youth. Yeah. Really. There's a line, and you convey, we'll just say Lizzie, as, you know, throwing things out there sometimes, not necessarily to be taken seriously, um, where she says, meeting her was the worst thing that could have happened to you as a writer. <laughs> it's not the first time. She, that it was the first time she said it, I'm but sure it wasn't she said the last multiple. time. <laughs> um, uh, do you think of, especially in the process of, of writing this book, do you think of the, the alternate Daryls? Are you able to, oh, sure. to envision who you could have been? or well, Not who I could have been, but you know, one thing about hanging out and, yeah. and New Wave and all that drug taking was how much time it took. Even if, you know, it's young life. Uh, um, uh, but uh, I think also, looking back, I, I see how hard everyone worked. Um, uh, you know, that it was as much part of things uh, as, as the wildness. In fact, the work and the, the wildness was all sort of together, but people were trying things. So I think that, um, yes, you know, had I been able to find a different way, I mean, had I succeeded at, say, writing a novel earlier than I did, maybe things would have been different. Uh, I, I never particularly wanted to go to graduate school or anything like that. Um, I certainly never wanted to be straight or anything like that. So um, it's very hard to live out your choices. I think that's the thing you find out when you're older, that it's, it's rather hard to live out certain alternative Choices in, in terms of the narrowing of life, or at least the the I'm a little too old to be the the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys now. No, the so insecurities and okay. the 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 doubts. You know, um, it's very hard to convince yourself that the world needs another book. <laughs> Uh, in the best of times. I find it very easy to convince myself the world does not need another book, but that's just me. So. Well, you see, so, you know, the, it sort of doubles the struggle mm -hmm. because the, you have to mean what you say about the rewards um, because, the, you know, they're not measurable um, in any other way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I don't know, uh, I kind of think of it uh, there was this guy Horace Caton who together with St. Clair Drake wrote this very seminal work of sociology Black Metropolis in 1945 and it was a, a, sort of this uh, important work of sociology and description at the time and I, when I read his autobiography I was very surprised um, um, he was from Seattle and uh, you know, his, he had a grandfather who'd been a slave and another who had uh, Japanese servants. Um, and his own life sort of didn't go so well. And he was writing this autobiography before, you know, things really ended badly. He died in Paris in the middle of trying to write a book about Richard Wright. And you don't get many examples of failure in the black autobiographical tradition, mm -hmm. since all of them follow what Skip Gates once said is the uh, pattern of the slave narrative, the existence of the book, uh, assures the reader that the fugitive made it to some place safe from which to look back and reflect on his or her experiences um, in bondage and then escaping. And I suppose autobiography, depending on which moment in your life is written, 
uh, follows the same sort of convention. Uh, and so I'm looking back on a story of failure, really, uh, with the promise of her example saying, you know, nevertheless, press on. Uh, you know, she she certainly couldn't be... It's not that she was helplessly the kind of writer that she was. I think she really cultivated what she could do, which was a lot. But for her, it was more what she was interested in. In Susan's case, it was making uh, the best of what she could do. No one was worse at dialogue than Susan Sontag. She was, she was worse than I was uh, at dialogue. <laughs> and Lizzie could write it, but she wasn't interested in it. Mm-hmm. And that's a different sort of choice uh, when it's something you can't do and something you're just not interested in. Yeah. So as a sort of conscious writer, she certainly was a model about not wasting time over what you can't do and to make choices about what you can and to cultivate <clears throat> this area to the fullest. In her sense, it was voice, you know, uh, and sensibility were her resources, really. You prefer her essays or her or short fiction? Well, I don't really make a distinction. Okay. Um, That's true. In the book, you... you uh, For me, it's all imaginative prose, and because there's a personal connection to it, I'm interested in everything. Mm -hmm. In the case of Virginia Woolf, my uh, feeling about it has changed over time. The novels that I read and reread obsessively as a kid, I cannot look at now. Mm -hmm. But you can always read a Virginia Woolf essay, you know. Um, And certain things I think I'll read again and and I don't yeah. but you know what books do you go back to well, well, what do you find yourself going back to these last few years you know I go back to uh, well the problem also is work uh, sends you back to certain texts sure. all the time and so reading for pleasure becomes the thing that's hard to Oh, trust to do. me. I, I know that doing 50 of these a year, I, you know, I have to make sure I'm reading the guest's exactly. books. And then yeah. there's, you know, yeah, what yeah. do you do on the side? Yeah, right. yeah. So yeah. things I probably didn't understand at the time. Mm-hmm. I had a reason to read Chaucer again. And that was a very different experience. Um, probably informed, though, by what I remember from class, in a way. I don't read things again so much as <laughs> there's so many things I haven't read yet that I'm still sort of doing that. If I read things again, it tends to be poetry mm-hmm. and, and things I haven't read in a long, long, long time. I hadn't read The Death of Arthur since, I don't know, a long, long time. Uh, and it's a different experience reading it now. And it was my mother's favorite poem. I, ha- I found my junior high school copy of Vanity Fair and uh, really have no memory of it. But it was my mother's favorite novel, and I'm reading it now stunned, uh, because how could this black girl in Atlanta like someone who was so mean? (laughs) What is Becky Sharp saying to my mother, who has to behave all the time? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you you go back to things with different questions, but I I haven't really found that time or that mood. Mm -hmm. Uh, Isherwood was someone I I read a lot over and over again uh, through the years. Uh, A lot of books you're afraid to sort of read again. But uh, there are some prose works you go back to as though they're poetry. Um, Pasternak might be one, Heine another. Um, uh, But there's so much that... I don't know, that keeps coming out. There's a Joseph Roth every time you turn around. <laughs> you know, there's just volumes of Hazlitt that I still don't know. And, mm. and you know, what Shakespeare play am I an expert on? None. So, you know, uh, especially if you're going to see it again, it's nice to sort of read. Have you gone out to the theater since we've started re-entering the world? When we spoke two years ago before there was a, a vaccine, so we were still kind of 
figuring um, out what a social interaction would be. <laughs> I did a, another piece with Robert Wilson in Dusseldorf. I didn't go to the rehearsals, um, but I did go to the opening, and that was the first time I'd been back to Europe in a while. And uh, it was an adaptation of Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. And you know, with Robert Wilson, the rabbit always comes out of the hat. Yeah, it was beautiful, and he's doing. Ubu Roy in Palma. I wish I could go. I miss you. Miss living in Europe for the ease of getting to different sort of performances you don't get here. Uh, but we have gone out here. What have I seen? Well, not the things I want to talk about on the record. No, understand the record. Yeah. I'll leave those two out that come to mind. No worries. But it's been nice to hear live music again. Yeah. Uh, that's been really thrilling, mm -hmm. like a, a small, um, uh, um, there's a young group called Owls, a string quartet, mm -hmm. and they played at the Baryshnikov Art Center last week, and it was wonderful to be there on a rainy night listening to music I didn't know since they played new music. I was watching a documentary about Ron Carter yesterday on a, it was, it was on PBS, but it was covering five or six years of his life, but part of it was him asking other jazz musicians, what are you going to play or do when we get back on stage again after two years? And like Diana Krall at one point was like, I swear to God, if anybody starts a blues number, I'll just start crying. <laughs> there. Like person after person was exactly. just you know, yeah. trying to figure out what it's going to be like to just be back out there. For people who've been playing for decades and yeah. had to suddenly, you know, cut oh, well, everything off. Every musician was in the same boat, yeah. whether you were a manual act or someone just out of Juilliard. You know, no matter your level, everyone was suddenly without an audience. An audience, uh, an and you sort of doing all these sort of home Zoom concerts, and yeah. you know, they they all seem like as quaint as um, what's that German painter who did the little domestic scenes in the eighteen forties? Uh, Menzel. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that the one? Hmm. Okay. And anyway, it doesn't matter. My whole thing was just trying. The one time I was going to be on national TV, it was, I basically rearranged my desk so that I had an insane array of books behind me just so if this actually aired, people were going to, my God, why does he have all those books behind him if he's talking about pharmaceutical manufacturing? And unfortunately... Um, we recorded January 6, 2021, at about noon. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished up. I was got upstage. Yes. Yeah, so I was like, oh, thank God, that's over. I'm done with all this stress and anxiety. Let me turn the TV on and see what's happening. And I thought, oh, I don't think that segment's ever going to air, is it? It's the last um, time we watched TV. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, so. then we just sort of took it out. Yeah, um, I truly had a great. I, I have photos of, of what that bookshelf was like. It, it really would have been one of those rate my, my blow shelves it things. A, do it as a postcard. Yeah, that, that could be my thing. Yeah, that's a postcard. And I did go to dance recently. Yeah. I saw a rehearsal, and that was exhilarating to see the body in motion after this kind of stillness yeah. and getting old sitting there. That kind of thing. Did it help for writing the, the, the isolation or? Drive you nuts. Uh, not having a choice to do something else yeah. was the driving one's nuts problem. Mm -hmm. My bad habits at the desk remain no matter what. Yeah. So um, I'm sure it helped. No. Uh, getting started for me is always a big drama. But once I'm into something, I can keep going. So I think... Um, um, you know, I would have sort of been able to keep going once I'd got the boulder rolling, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's more upsetting to realize now that it's over how little difference it makes to the way I live, and I'm yeah. and I can't tell if these changes are a function of age or the habits of the pandemic still in me. For me, I think it's it's that the latter. Uh, there are aspects. I got out more back in, 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 I used to do this every weekend yeah. and now it's, well, let me figure out who I can do in person yeah. and how many more remotes yeah. I can do. Yeah. And even traveling, I, I had a, a business trip to Grand Rapids. Uh, it's an hour and a half flight, at mo an hour and a half on the plane and only my third flight since all this started. And I was tired. 
when I got to Michigan, I was like, oh my God, I, I'm actually tired from all this. And I used to do this, you know, two or three times a month. Uh, either I have to get back to this or I live a very different life than I, I lived before. Yeah, it's some kind of stress, added stress to yeah. small decisions Right. that is just with you, you know. Am I going to ride downtown with the windows up? Am I going to ask him to put on a mask? Am I going to take a subway? No. I'll, I'll put it this way. One of the things about recording in the city, with anyone uh, downtown, I invariably, in the before time, would park on West 96th at this uh, great garage that leads right to the West Side yes. Highway, walk up to the, the one, two, and three, garage. yeah, <laughs> next to the mobile station, and subway wherever I had to go. I don't do that now. I drive... You know, I've, I've driven to some not, you know, just congested, awful areas of, of downtown in the village. I'm like, I'll just drive there instead rather than deal with yeah. potential exposure My on the subway. My bill is, you know, like yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> I'll be doing that in London this weekend where I'm just, just taking a, a cab everywhere I go. But uh, Well, uh, that, there I'll probably do the metro for, or the, the, the tube for some stuff. But No, I would take the bus. Well, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see I would walk. I that's, I mean, that's what I'm then, planning on. And then likely. probably, I mean, Marina lives, everyone, everyone you're going to see lives in the Northwest, yeah. probably. So It'll be easy enough. Uh, but let me ask, you yeah. mentioned being a failure earlier, and I don't know if, you were, <laughs> if you're referring solely to your fiction writing, or is that how you, you see your, your whole shebang? Well. What is failure? Or, uh not it to put it you on might the spot. be the whole shebang. Yeah. Uh, the fiction thing, well... You did a second novel, which I haven't read, uh, I guess 2016? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, that was the Berlin novel. Well, I don't know. Uh, one meant to write more. You know, one would always do things differently. Um, I have had for a long time a work on... Uh, African-American literature uh, um, that um, got so large, I never could finish it, and it still do. This, this is sold and gone. This ties back to the, the memoir where the biggest connection I have with you is that when we read Middlemarch the first time, we both identified with Castle Bar. <laughs> <because Yes. laughs> we're both going to be the guy who has the key to all mythologies, but never actually writes a word of it. So. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, go. <laughs> no, that's it. I felt so so close to you in that moment. I was like, oh, thank oh, God. He felt the exact same thing. <laughs> when my sisters got sick, I just read everything in the basement of the British Library. And so hmm. I have this 900-page manuscript of summaries of all the literature written before 2007. It's not a footnote after that because it's sort of when I, I stopped going to the library. And so there's this thing that I sort of have to cut down or find a way to um, dispense with just to sort of get rid of it because it's, you know, it's this contract I, owe, I still owe. Mm -hmm. um, and it represents, you know, a, a lot of work I would sort of like to salvage. The problem is, you know, I have these projects in mind and not sure I have enough time for them. So you're in a race with, uh, not just with time, but with your character. And that is a losing battle for me because I'm rather spoiled and lazy and self-destructive <laughs> and, you know... Just hand me an opportunity and I'll throw it away as far as I can. You've made it this far, for Christ's sake. I mean, in I do the same thing. Myself. Okay, okay, fine. I mean, myself. I tell people I have... I was no, lucky in my editors. You know, I'm lazy with no rigor, and yet somehow we're on episode 510 at this there point. So yeah. it just turned out... You know, talking Someone once said in AA, you're very disciplined at beating yourself up. So Yeah, yeah. that's, that's very know, good. Uh, the rest is just propaganda. You know, we, we do what we can. Um, so, yes. Um, and, you know, the, the, certainly not failure. This is just kind of Sunday whining of this uh, feeling rather alienated from the moment. Um, well, it's very hard to uh, relate to what's going on. It's such a change uh, from things previously. And so in some ways I'm glad that I wrote the book because 
Um, I mean it as a tribute to yeah. this very important person in my life, and not just Elizabeth Hardwick, but also Barbara Epstein and Robert Silvers. And, and what the whole New York Review meant. The whole New York yeah. Review thing, and my friends from then as well, who are still friends uh, that I value, and um, whom I value. And, but also to the time, which you know feels to me like a golden age, and uh, I don't sort of, I find it bewildering to have this sort of baby boomer generalities uh, uh, because what I'm also describing is very cloistered minority culture, mm. um, uh, you know, and the sort of demonized liberalism that's blamed or used to justify really horrible stuff going on now, scarcely had a chance uh, back then, but was just so brilliantly articulated that it's all still around what the right and what the know-nothings mind about liberal culture is, is its prestige and the brilliance of a lot of the work associated with it. That doesn't come, there's, you know, there's no comparable text in conservative thinking. Uh, if they're only the texts that they've appropriated, like Adam Smith, you know, mm -hmm. that's not entirely his fault. Um, so yes, it's a, it's, um, uh, 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 it's a memorial, you know? And so, uh, you know, it's meant to be funny, but it makes me sad to remember it because it's a lost time as well. Did it feel like a golden age? Oh, yes. In the moment? Yes. At the yeah. time, we often really people think knew. it's the time before them, and you do. You Sorry? do say often people think it, it's always the time before them. No. And you, you bring up the like going through the bound copies of the New York Review from the '60s before your your. If anything, we but, were anxious to be a continuation, yeah. not just of the '60s, but you know the beats were still around, mm -hmm. and you could sort of hang out with them and stuff like that. And uh, uh, it was the birth of modernism was still new insofar as uh, the part it played in the culture of the time. You know, this was still, Stravinsky was still around. These were still things to admire, look up to, and learn from. One of the biggest uh, surprises to me is when I listen to people dismiss Picasso. Um, yeah. You know, well, you don't have to be uh, a shit to be uh, a genius, and who gets to say who's a genius anyway? Right. And you think, have you ever looked at his painting? I mean... Yeah. Or looked what was before and, and yeah. after. I mean... Yeah, you talked, get no... Sorry. Yeah, oh, no, go on. No, no. I was going to say, we talked a little last time about that sense of... The professionalization of culture, yeah, and and you know this the attempt at, um, well, you, you mentioned the mystery of talent and, yeah. and genius and the way we try to kind of algorithm that out of existence, and it's something that's come up in recent weeks with the show where there's more. The, we've had conversations with with guests about the everything is good but nothing's great, you know the the way. Well, okay, but this I mean, is professionalism. Yeah. Think things are fine, they're Everyone consumable, can do et cetera. Everyone things to a certain level, yeah. uh, a certain sort of level of accomplishment. Right. Everyone can sort of do it, and there's so much of it. Um, uh, years ago, if you said, I'm going to be a novelist, your family freaked out. Yeah. Now, they, you know, what writing school are you going to, and yeah. what contacts have you made there, et cetera. It's not a scandal as a future uh, anymore. Uh, but also what the arts do uh, has changed so much. But, you know, we're not paying attention to how broad this spectrum is because we're sort of still measuring... No, because uh, the measures of success have somehow become such a market question yeah. as opposed to anything else. The novels that we admire from... The 70s, etc. You know, 
uh, uh, weren't bestsellers at the time. Uh, they were just written about uh, and and promoted uh, in certain worlds. And now that people have turned against these worlds, you don't have the same authority, uh, trusted or, you know, turn to maybe this is social media I don't know um, but you know everyone's a star now and everyone's got an opinion yeah. so and that that Warhol <laughs> thing where we're all yeah yeah you know and I you know Warhol, Warhol was very much around at the time and yeah. I once held his ashtray at a party <laughs> but I was never particularly into Warhol or interested yeah. in Warhol though I did once go through a phase of drinking too much at Max's Kansas City when I first got to yeah. New York and my father came out and gave me a little speech on how he got out of the army. He drank too much because he didn't know what to do. But I did know what to do. I could go back to class. <laughs> or well, you're, not. You, yeah, you, you make a I'll say tangential reference or an obscure reference to rehab in in the book. Um, I think in another one of the parentheticals, um, and in terms of, of, you know, the, the, the life changingness of it, it's, it's implied, but not, not, you know, you you don't go over the top by any means. And it comes near the end of the book, of course, also, but, but yeah, it's, um, I wonder with certain writers, whether, uh, the process of, cleaning up and, you know, doing the, the work as, as it's known, uh, impacts the writing at all beyond just the, I'm not drinking myself into a stupor and I'm able to write. Well, that's a big, that's the biggest one Yeah, that you suddenly, you know, your life at your table changes. Uh, James was once doing some research on Hemingway, and he said you can always see where he's given up for the night (laughs) or the the ink starts running (laughs) out. Because he marks the place himself. You know, sort of what not to trust afterward, <laughs> and and he's never wrong. So yes, your relationship to the workday changes. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I, I was. Uh, while we're recording this, Peter Sheldahl, the New Yorker art yeah. critic, died a few days ago, and David Remnick's little remembrance about him just came out last night, and he mentioned hiring uh, uh, Peter to to be the art critic at the New Yorker, and. He said, I think at the time they were sitting down, he said, your resume has this gap in it. And Peter's response was, that's when I was a falling down drunk. But I fixed that and that won't be a problem now. <laughs> it's just the, okay, you've, you've completely laid it out. So, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, he's from that world. Yeah, yeah. you know, where it's... Well, I used to... Have, uh, Lucy Sant has on his Instagram account some of the uh, photographs of... Uh, shell doll catalog covers yeah. or poetry covers or something. And I remember one in particular. Oh, I used to have that, but of course I, when I was selling books to do drugs, I, <laughs> that went. Do you consider it lucky that there was an apartment fire that ate up a bunch of your, your journals and such? No. Okay. Because I, I was, my roommate suffered. Oh, okay. So, yeah. no. But as far as the personal, uh, not having to look back at who you were in those, those couple no, of years? No, because actually, you know, I'm not sure about the beginning of the book, really, because of these, these, the, <laughs> these diaries burned at the edges. So, you know, I sort of identifying when, what is when according to my handwriting. Hmm. And uh, I was thinking, well, it's possible I knew her before I took her class. You know, but everything that I'm reading is a student teacher conversation. Yeah. But I you know, maybe I was already visiting her. But I don't know how that could be. So a chunk of I don't want to say a chunk, one of the threads early on or themes is the you need to, to read more, you need to you can never catch up, but you're trying to catch up. Did that ever change? No. Okay, making sure. No, <laughs> I didn't I, think you've ever. There's you all know. this Hazlitt I've not read. So, yeah. You know. Yeah, it's always no, the. No, no, no. And, you know, in one's life, one has met people who are, who were really well read. So that's a different. There are always holes week. and gaps, you know. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe they didn't read as much Du Bois as I had, but. 
<laughs> Which raises the other question that, again, when you brought up the very structure of the book, how much of a tension has it been for you as the, the black writer and the general literary and cultural writer? You know, the, the, the tensions of, of focusing on African American or, or black literature overall and not having to bring, quote unquote, the black perspective to, to other writing. Is it a, I, I well, know I'm phrasing this poorly no, and you'll understand, understand what, what you I mean. mean. Um, I don't know if I ever successfully did so for mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, again, uh, maybe this is the good part of academia. Uh, there's a young critic such as Jesse McCarthy who can talk about Foucault perfectly easily and not be uh, sort of... And it's not going out of his lane. Yeah. So in some ways, familiarity with this subject on the university level has... Uh, maybe freed people in the way they talk about it, but at the certain time, I don't find a lot of value in academic criticism. It's not been the way I've been interested in talking about books, you know. Um, and maybe that's why I don't make a distinction in her writing because reviews, essays, stories, the longer novel. Um, are all imaginative prose for her. It's just the occasions are very different. I think she would say novels are different because the it's a different project, just the length yeah. and the strategies to get from there to the end, whereas a short story and the essay um, maybe share when she's doing it uh, the same intensity and spell of concentration that, you know, it's harder to sustain over a period of yeah. several, several, several pages, if that makes any sense. Anyway, um, now I've slightly forgotten what you were asking me. Uh, being a black writer versus being oh, a cultural well, writer and... and yeah. uh, I mean, there's sort of different subjects, but they inform one another, yeah. which is what we used to say before, intersectionality. Yeah. You know? I don't know why <laughs> I, I people think that's that new. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, she, you know, Dr. Crenshaw is most respected. So, But all these things inform one another. It's just, um, I think for me in particular, it comes down to certain tastes and, I, and the fascination I always had with realism. Um, and um, there is that fiction descended from the squiggly line in Tristram Shandy that um, I have respect for, but it's not, it's, not, it's not the way I imagine the page filling up. And actually magic realism and um, uh, a kind of Nigerian magic realism, South American, Nigerian, and... And now, what to call it? Maybe a kind of metropolitan magic realism are very much sort of the order of things. Um, and makes you feel very old fashioned in your uh, arsenal of tools mm -hmm. that, you know. None of that you can do, or yeah, you know, passe, or or something like that. Or does an audience even know yeah. what it was? Yeah, there are things that are, we'll say, um, again, passe, but you know, turn out to be fresh when people start to look at them and Maybe. realize, oh, these are actually really good modes to to tell a story. Maybe. Also, I think uh, you know, uh, one other things. Uh, uh, that one learns from writers like Isherwood and Hardwick is these uses of the first person doesn't mean that it's confessional. It just means that uh, you're establishing a kind of authorial, um, uh, well, authority of presence, really. Yeah. You, know, you place yourself in the story as the observer 
And that way you don't have to account for anything because it's all seen and witnessed, it's understood. But you don't have to really... I'm not interested in telling stories about myself, particularly. Uh, Ever committed? They any? don't come out very well. <laughs> uh, again, I just I don't a, come out very well. In yeah, the, that, that's <laughs> generally how, how it goes. Any story I tell degenerates into you know self uh, self deprecating neurotic humor. But well, you have to be careful about these days that sort of thing because young people will believe you. Yeah, th there are people I've met through the show who actually take seriously some of the things I've, I've said about myself. Well, you understand those are exaggerated. Oh, whatever. That's, that's fine. You know, I'll just you know, leave yeah. it out there. You don't really get to hide your narcissism anymore. Yeah. You have to, they <laughs> demand that you own Beyond it. Performing and, and display. Mine doesn't function that way. Yeah. Um, my narcissism is that I don't have time for social media. I cannot read what you think. Yeah. Because I'm too busy worried about what I think. For me, it's turned so much more into discovering books and, and, you know, potential guests than it is, you know, trying to, to, you know, understand the nuances of this, that, and the other. I, I just don't care. Um, well, you do throw out things that make us worried. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, you know, the, the general, what yeah. happened at the pharma conference? Then? Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> there, there are many stories I could tell about how that, that conference went. It, it's one of the, the aspects of, Gil has come to the realization that he is a micromanaging control freak in ways beyond the, the typical things that he thought once upon a time. And I've, I've come to realize the, yeah, I'm, I'm a one man show here. I'm a one man show at my job. I'm a one man show in a lot of different respects. And it turns out that actually interacting with other human beings and relying on them can be a good thing, except of course, when they let you down every single goddamn time. But anyway, that's, that's <laughs> neither here nor there, but you see, yeah, there's a, there's there's aspects where I realize anything I, I have to complain about is just you know first world problems and, and griping. But oh, see, yeah, that's another thing. It's you still know, fun. We have to, but, our yeah. global understanding makes us situate ourselves in a, an apologetic context all yeah. the time, and so you know the um, it's well, hard enough to take yourself seriously. Yeah, especially when you know you're not one of those people who takes himself too seriously. I worry that I do. Um, and, and part of that corrective is sitting down with another human being and gabbing, uh, you know, at least once a week for the show yeah, is true. just the, oh, it turns out all that stuff in my head, um, you know, shared. Yeah. Once, once you interact and you, you capture a lot of that in the, the course of the book, the assumptions and some of the things you had going on in your head that got blown up once you interacted with Elizabeth with with Barbara with Sontag and with uh, Lucy Luke at the the time and a number of other people your uh -huh. your world gets changed um, okay. even while you convey yourself as being uh, explicitly a, as an outsider that this wasn't my scene but I was here to to witness it um, in a number of different scenarios but when always well I felt like that all the time yeah that I didn't belong have you ever felt a sense of belonging? Did you feel a sense of belonging on the sofa in, in Lizzie's home? Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. When you put it that way, yeah. Because that, that seems like the closest thing you have to yeah. a core of yourself. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, when you have a corresponding experience at Barbara's home, there's always a, a tension and a distance because she's co-editor. And, and well, I got to know her much better later. Yeah. You see, all the Susan and Barbara felt just outside of the... The time frame of the book. Uh, yes. Yeah. So. Tell um, me how the New York Review has changed for you, especially with, with Barbara and, and Robert dying in, in... Well, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Certainly. And not to put you, not to put you in a position of saying, "Oh, well, it's terrible now because blah blah blah," but you know. Um, well, I don't want lost? to be. I asked Daniel Mendelssohn the same thing, and, and you know he was very diplomatic too. So don't don't worry about uh, that. <laughs> no, well, for me, I don't want to fall in the position of being the old guy who always, who says, "Well, in my day, in my day, yeah, my day, that that day is gone." <coughs> I'm more interested in just listening to what. You know, new people are saying and not judging it um, in relation to what was, because that is gone. And, you know, the great change in New York uh, has in part 
the shift from all these institutions being run or driven by founding personalities to them trying to survive or adapt in, uh, in, a, in a changed economy of culture. Sure. And so they're sort of very different demands. The New York Review was a very fragile operation its first 10 or 15 years. But it could be, it could get away with being it because the cost of paper or this or that. And now, um, you know, the pressure on publishing houses, because there aren't a lot of printing houses anymore or, yeah. you know, so various things. Then, too, uh, a lot of these founding personalities are gone. And uh, I think the last generation of assistants in Robert Silver's office really minded his way of behaving in the office. But, you know, our generation kind of, we didn't like it. But he wasn't, yeah. you know, an isolated figure in this respect. Um, I'm just reading a novel by Wesley Brown about Miles Davis. <laughs> and there's a scene in which, as before he's even graduated from high school, uh, he's hanging out with the, playing with the Billy Eckstein band, and they're all treating him like shit, um, just because he's very low on the totem pole. Yeah. But he wouldn't be there if he wasn't gifted enough to be there. Right. So that was the understanding that, you know, it was a kind of hierarchy of, I don't know. Well, the review had no hierarchy. It was Bob Barber, and then everyone else had a job that they, that we did or yeah. whatever. Uh, you also but, have the great moment in the book where you interviewed with, uh, it's just a paragraph where you interviewed with George Plimpton at the uh, Paris Review and uh, literally says, I'm so glad you've, you've got a, a recommendation from Elizabeth, but we don't want anybody who's you know aggressive or ambitious. He I did think. say that. <laughs> and I you're talking to me? I was so proud because <laughs> you know, he was this known kind of sportsman. And actually, he was a very nice guy. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've did see him, et cetera. But um, no. But another yeah. one that, again, the personality yes. and, and some of the behavior, you know, I'm you couldn't sure. do nowadays, no, but, you, you know, at the time it was. Um, I mean, there's stories about a lot of the people who certainly couldn't. But in Bob's time, you know, none of this was personal. He, you know, he didn't, it's not that he didn't remember any of it, it was. You know, he would see the same assistants outside the office, and he was actually a rather civilized and charming man. Yeah. Uh, but he behaved that way because it was his. Yeah. And probably because he was a guy, you know. Uh, but this personal, this is mine, et cetera, all that's gone. This ballet company, this theater company, this publishing house, it's not yours anymore. You know, it's been sold or it's part of something else or the people working there don't think of themselves as underlings. They, they're stakeholders and if they want to change the way they see themselves in relation to the institution, that's what's happened. It has a bad uh, side effect. There is this phantom junior staff that trustees and senior personnel are afraid of in that can cancellation way, which has led to sort of sensitivity readers or uh, um, interventions in work that I find unacceptable. You know, I'm not for censorship uh, at all. Uh, I think part of free speech is putting up with stuff you don't like. Yeah. It's just become a different question now that the truth itself uh, is at stake um, and I don't buy French-derived versions of the truth is what you say it is. Yeah. No. You know, the truth is the thing that's there that you either admit to or waste a lot of time denying. Yeah. Uh, so, but in the world of literary culture, you know, I find all that really unfortunate and unacceptable and unhelpful. So maybe the reason things are just good and nothing's great is that everyone is being controlled externally or internally. And so, you know, the price of taking a risk is to be uh, ejected into outer space or whatever. 
you know, and it's very hard for the young who watch um, success strike like lightning here and there uh, to believe in the patience to live out your choice or to defer to another time the possibilities of recognition or to find satisfaction with the recognition you get either from a smaller world or from the inside. And the review was a small world. Yeah. It's one of the things that made it so intense um, and so familial, but it had a large kind of echo. I don't know what to say. And I find these days this kind of personality-driven publication is not quite there. And if there's anything wrong, it's that everything is very good, but it's all kind of the same, even from magazine to magazine. Um, even with the New York Review, I mean, you watch, well, I watched that documentary long before this whole world, and there was very much a sense of, wow, yeah, up through the 90s. This was something, and you know, it's, it's a different thing. And uh, I mean, when you get down to the identity, you know, it's one thing when you have a genius like David Levine, mm. you know, doing your your illustrations and, That's and all be this, and then problem. it's just art now, and it's it's very different than yes, and also Barbara's eye because she chose all the other illustrations, right? You know, uh, so there was a lot of wit in these Daumier and things like that, and. Edward Gorey, and people hadn't used these people before, Yeah, you know, so in another way, it's just 50 years have gone by or 60 years have gone by. So all this stuff was bound to happen. It's just, you know, a worry about what we used to worry what poetry can do, but now we're worried about what words and language can do, especially sort of under threat. Um, in ways that, you know, make you think of Klemper or, or stuff like that. And so, you know, they say all the time every election is crucial, but this one I think really is, you know, that that all across the world, these moments to kind of hold the line. And it's not working. I mean, the idea there's Marcos again in the Philippines. Yeah. You know, and James went to write about Duterte in, I think, 2016. And, you know, he said when he was back, or after Trump, he said, well, Trump is Duterte. And it's all, they're all yeah. kind of the same, even if they're in such different situations. It's the same impulse and the same attempt at, at hijacking. Well, fascism does share certain kind of yeah. elements There's a playbook. that identify it yeah. as that. And when we talked two years ago, you were, we spoke in, again, maybe September, October 2020, mm -hmm. shortly before the election. And you were, um, I'll say optimistic about the Black Lives Matter protests of the summer and the, well, uh, you know, saying that we're still seeing police murder black people on a regular basis. How the, pre, uh, the, 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 the following two years, I guess, you know, what is it? meant to you? Have you seen the culture? Well, I think that um, on the level of police reform, people have had to get more real because um, not having police um, is not uh, an answer uh, to anything. Um, New York City felt a little kind of at the mercy of a sort of random violence that you know, no police presence could have done anything about. Yeah. So maybe that discussion got more real. Um, I've seen an advertisement, a young woman journalist is asking the question, what happened to this $80 million Black Lives Matter raised? And I used to hear sort of whispers of this, but no one wanted to talk about it openly. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly has had an, an effect in places where it would have anyway. You know, the, again, these liberal cultural institutions and, and universities that are desperate to do the right thing, no matter how silly. Um, uh, I find some of the sensitivity training 
really yeah. insulting. Not the sexual harassment training, uh, because that has to do with things that have changed customs in the workplace that, you know, uh, since my time in an office workplace, you know, uh, I, I now ask women, is it all right to tell you that you look okay? You know, and they say, yeah. yes, but they're women I know, yeah. you know, I wouldn't say it to a stranger or something like that. Anyway, so, but a lot of that I find really, you know, uh, my father used to say social change brings a lot of opportunity and many opportunists. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's certainly a lot of that around. Um, I think that, uh, ironically, um, Black Lives Matter has had more an effect on the middle class than uh, elsewhere. Uh, you know, in, in the sense of who's been appointed, the pro changes in programs and attitudes and things like that. And it's come at a price. You know, I don't want to see the European painting wing at the Metropolitan Museum sort of shunted off to the side. But Or Lincoln Center has announced it's not doing Western music and it's Lincoln Center programs. If you want to do that, you have to go to the Philharmonic or the Met or the State. But the programs that Lincoln Center does, it's not going to be Western music anymore. And I was thinking, why do you think Western music's all white? You know, I went to a concert the other night and poor Florence Price was cheered and she never got to hear her fourth symphony. Never. Uh, so yeah, this I, is all crazy. When I was a student at Hampshire College in the early 90s, which I believe is a precursor to this entire world, <laughs> we're, we're in, um, there was something called the third world expectation. Even though we had no requirements, <laughs> there was an expectation you would do something that either was covering you know, third world or minorities or women or they use third world as an unfortunate umbrella term for everyone who is not a, a straight white male. Yeah. Um, I managed to succeed my, my or accomplish my third world expectation by writing about Borges, which I thought was you know, <laughs> secretly a, yeah, but I'm going to sneak in and still do a, a white guy who's in a European Ross. tradition. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt, you know, let me subvert is this so as best I can. Funny. <laughs> uh, Borges. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's someone I've not read enough of. Same. But I, I did enough to get through at Hampshire, which was... Um, a lot. Yeah, it, it was an interesting world. And it was just at that period where those sorts of, of sensitivities and, and interventions were something I blundered into. Yeah. You know, I was just some schlub white kid from the suburbs. Yeah. And all of a sudden I had to figure out how oppressive I was being and, you know, what you can say and can't say to people. But they used, they did that to people in the 60s, yeah. too. Yeah. You know, so... It's a kind of. It raises you know, a question because you get someone, a little kind of leverage from these tools yeah. socially. Yeah. The I recorded with Vivian Gornick in recent years, and she comes up in the book as someone who, again, in one of your your parentheticals, uh, someone tells you that she revised her opinion of of Lizzie Hardwick, felt she was too hard on Hardwick's positions and, and takes. I would ask, A, you know, how much of that stuff was taken seriously in the moment? And, and B, who do you find yourself revising and, and coming around on in certain well, ways? Well, I put that parent, parenthetical aside in where Margot Jefferson has That's seen right. this piece where Vivian Gordick says that maybe she would have done it differently. Because I was thinking of the time when Elizabeth Harbick said that she's sorry she was so mean to Simone de Beauvoir when she wrote about the second sex in 1952 because what she was saying then didn't become possible until 20 year, 25 yeah. years later for, for women. Uh, and, but I remember the article in The Voice at the time and it seemed really kind of rough uh, on Lizzie and, uh, you know, um, Vivian Gornick, you know, they had, the Village Voice had a very kind of intense feminist component uh, Jill Johnston, Laurie Stone, Vivian Garnick, a few quite a few others, um, uh, um, uh, very different from her image now, which is this, you know. Uh, uh, I, think, I don't want to say a, August literary figure, but well, but she, it, it sort know, of ascended it, into yes, that. Yes, and you know, you know uh, the, the Walker in the city and her yeah. 
you know, her own memoirs of her education and her, you know, sort of Jewish roots in the city. Uh, it's a, you know, people change or, you know, time goes by. Uh, at the, there was a time when, you know, feminists really didn't like Elizabeth Hartwick. Uh, uh, and I'm very pleased that a younger generation of women are very interested in her. Mm-hmm. Um, but for a long time, she wasn't. Um, or in her own lifetime, she was regarded with some suspicion. Uh, as were most of the women who wrote for the review, because they didn't speak this language of patriarchy. You know, they didn't. They didn't talk the lingo. And you um, mentioned the, the the being a wife of another writer in yeah. in some respects. You know, colored it as as they weren't the same as as some of the solo or the the women who were. Well, I think that in, it's very particular yeah. to the Lowell Hardwick story. Sure. And so people were split over what it meant for her to not answer him. Uh, was how they saw it. Whereas to me, Seduction and Betrayal um, is talking about uh, divorce and Caroline Blackwood, really, uh, for a long time. Uh, And by the time she got around to writing Sleepless Nights or finishing Sleepless Nights, he died. Um, And it changed the tone of... no. It changed something about the book. Uh, uh, I think it went... uh, Yes, it changed the ending of the book. uh, And this sort of atmosphere of um, forgiveness instead of uh, injury. Uh, Whereas I think earlier drafts, uh, she took out lines like... uh, uh, she has in the original version there was sort of oh you could not know that such swift fleeing no soul for seeing not even I would undo me so um, there's a part in the original where she says but why do I put in more damage than most and she says that I feel in my heart I I am more sort of damaged than most so uh, uh, some removals I've not gotten over and I am like everyone else an amputee, but why do I put in like everyone else? I fear that if I say an amputee and more so than anyone else, I will be embarrassing, overreaching. And in my heart, I do believe I am more damaged than most. And this is, you know, after Caroline and the birth of Sheridan and things like that. This feeling of abandonment or uh, sort of injury. And in the final versions, these lines are just not there in the published version, uh, uh, because poor guy, he's, you know, he's dead. And so there's a much more ends on a note of forgiveness and the drift of life, you know, ends more like a piece of jazz than a Baroque composition. Uh, so I think it became more about memory and less about the problems of fiction and shifted from the kind of aloneness of a certain kind of woman in the city to the city and the destiny of older women left over and what that means. Hmm. So I think yeah, the sense of life expanded after he died. I would say from the, the, the line we used last time uh, that... Lizzie had given you that that writing uh, comes from desperation or revenge. <laughs> yes. It sounds as though it's moved from revenge into oh, this is just desperation. This this is what you know it's like. But but yeah, the mortality the shifted. I think mortality yeah. got in there. Yeah. yeah, yes, and yes, a sort of you know <clears throat> the love for him lost its anger and sense of sacrifice. And she was much more inclined to think of what she got from him. And I can remember sometimes reminding her of things he got from her, uh, which people don't talk about as much. Um, you know, uh, she, I didn't put this in because I can't, couldn't remember the poem it was she was talking about. <clears throat> but she said that, you know... She, she said, well, actually, you know, the, his last lines, he had trouble with last lines. 
uh, something about the sonnet form being always in his head and this kind of burden of these last sort of couplets, even when he wasn't writing that way. And she would say to him sometimes, well, actually, I think you mean the opposite. And the next thing she knew, he was kind of changing (laughs) the ending of these poems, you know, to sort of take the not out or put not in, you know, that kind of thing. She was, you know, in that way, a very good reader because she understood his intentions, you know, when he started out on a lot of this stuff. I don't think he would have written sleep, uh, Life Studies had she not, in some ways, encouraged him in this material after his mother died. Hmm. Uh, and it's a big change in his work from the very rhetorical poems of Land of Unlikeness and the Mills of the Cavanaugh and stuff like that. You know, the Leap to Life Studies and For the Union Dead. This, I think, is her. Um, because it's also political in a way. And she had a much, much more skeptical by nature than he was um, because, you know, his education is all in a very grand classical tradition, uh, guy handing on to guy. Uh, it's what he understood. And hers is much more sort of, mm. <laughs> now, You also have a two-writer Household, yes. That level of complementarity between no, you, or you're both established he, enough as, as writers he, he, and, and have your own. You know. I don't read anything of his till it's in print. Okay. He he scarcely will talk to me about it. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't Is it more like of a sense it. of at least you both understand what it goes that I'm not ignoring you. I'm writing. It, it, is that the 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 benefit? I guess of, of I guess somebody you know, in the same business. Um, I guess it's different. Yeah. Uh, Because, you know, we do different things, thank goodness, and we also go about them differently. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I used to be able to tell when we uh, lived in Oxford and he was walking around his garden when he was writing prose and when he was writing poetry because of the rhythm of his steps. And, you know, he... Yeah. I would never tell him that. And if he ever heard this, he would be really annoyed because he doesn't (laughs) like myth making at all uh, of any kind. Okay, fine. But it also says something about the kind of writer who can think. And so he thinks out what he's saying or he thinks what he's going to say. And by the time he writes it down, often it's the last stage. Sure. Whereas I don't know what I think until I write it down. So in this way, I understood Lizzie very well the sort of struggles of these first drafts, uh, because I have them. You know, I can't think. uh, Did you have them before you were working with her? Sorry? Did you have that habit before you met Lizzie? Or do you feel like it might be something that sort of... You mean of not knowing what I thought till I wrote it down? Yeah. Well, I think what I mostly wrote before I met her was just bullshit. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. It was too very at that know, point anyway. Kind of so. Reflex of this or that. Yeah. I mean, I had a rather political phase, I thought, uh, in my early days on uh, as a student. Uh, so what I wrote tended to be very predictable. Hmm. I found a, a very shocking paper I'd written for Martha Vasinus on Blake. Uh, the little black boy, and I, of course, destroyed the paper because you know, it's so influenced <laughs> by the militant moment of the times. I was rather shocked that I could say such fatuous things, but there it was. There's no end to the, the, the depths of our shallowness. <laughs> <laughs> that one yeah. n- n- didn't survive. Cool. You know, I'm surprised it's still sitting. It was still sitting in some envelope. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so. It did sort of change my writing. But also, you know, I had her around the same time that I was with uh, taking classes from Kenneth Koch and David Shapiro. And that was really very liberating uh, because um, they were truly sort of colorblind, you know. Uh, They didn't, you know, it was purely aesthetic. There were no sort of politics of of any kind. It was just assumed you weren't a shit, 
Yeah, you got to this point. Yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah. What's home to you? Home? Yeah, home. Uh, I mean, where Wherever home. he's sort of living. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I live in James Land. I don't live in Harlem. I didn't live in Oxford. I live in James Land, which is always a very special environment. I mean, he he can't help but make very beautiful places to live. I think it's part of sort of being that kind of boarding school orphan mm-hmm. in that English terrible way. Yeah, I visited once this. Uh, where he lived in the Philippines, and, you know, it was spectacular. Typhoon got rid of it, and he never had the heart to rebuild, but it was really sort of bamboo hut on stilts in the middle of all these ponds, and over the tree line is five miles of white beach. Yeah. You know, he, he can't help it. <laughs> I did take a picture of this room, but just to share it with my wife, I, I, I texted her, like, this is where we're recording. You what know, is just, her name? Amy. Amy. So yeah. I won't keep calling her your wife. Yeah, I know. I, I just figure, you know, that's, that's, that's some weird vestige of privacy or something like that. But no, you know, I, I link out to her, her photography stuff all the time. But yeah, I sent her this, uh, especially with this wonderful scene. I mean, if you can say James, I can say Amy. Yes, there we go. And someday, you know, maybe we'll get to, to right. meet up and yeah. uh, I'll drag you guys out to the woods of northern New Jersey. To, to, Do you really have bear? Yes. I, I will show you a picture of a bear walking through my backyard 60 seconds after I was walking through my backyard that morning. That's I, a YouTube post. Yeah, I, I just figured I'd go with the, the still picture because, you know, I, I was like, eh, that guy is walking right past while I'm making my morning coffee. And I was just out there in the backyard a minute ago. And, and it's life 25 miles from here, basically. But yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's a different sort of place, but I'm glad I get to. But aren't you know, they get moving out. sort of in as they get <laughs> yeah hungrier I, and less afraid? Yeah, as we developed further and further into their territory, they start finding places to eat. The town that I live in uh, instituted basically a building ban dec- uh, about 20 years ago because of the watershed and, and everything else that we feed other towns. So you can't put up anything new, and we're relative. We're not rural, but we're just on the other side of suburbs and um yeah some mornings i'll be you know typing away look up and some deer just walking by my window I'm yeah like, okay that's that's you know yeah just life uh we, they're very destructive oh yeah they're very beautiful but um amy is very unhappy her first year living everything with us. in the winter that was it well not even the uh, bark she uh, tried growing vegetables oh, uh, her first yeah. year living with me and uh Basically, the very last tomato, the very last day before she was going to pick it, just boom, just nailed that one, too. She's like, son of a bitch. So from there on, she has not tried to grow anything no. uh, outside of some stuff on the deck that's, yeah. that's isolated. But, uh, yeah, it's it's neat having that stuff nearby, but you realize all the ramifications. Well, you'll see all those sort of tree lines between the fields in England or Deer Highway. Yeah. And there's hundreds of them sort of running up and down. It's rather yeah. magnificent. And oh. they also don't have ticks. Yeah, so that's got to be a plus. You're not afraid of them. Yeah. It's one of the reasons James doesn't want to move to the country here. Yeah. It's the ticks. Oh, yeah. it's it's. We had a greyhound who we referred to as the ginger tick magnet because <laughs> of the, you know, basically five steps outside and we're already picking off a couple from him. And, yeah. Um, again, it's it's... There are all sorts of ecological issues we've we've created with this world. But, it's really you know, weird, isn't it? Yeah, but you know, you my know parents that. built there back in God before I was born, which means 1968, about 54 years ago. And uh, you know, for me, it's seeing New York at a distance changing, while the place where I live is just the trees getting taller every yeah. year. And, yeah. and you know, oh, there's snakes this year. That's interesting. But yeah, it's um, yes, New York is very changed. Yeah. Just the skyline, or that there is more than two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's say, how is this? How long have you been in Harlem? Ten years. Okay. But the house is on the market, and yeah, uh, James wants to go back to Britain. Okay. I'll, As do I. I was going to say I will. I will follow you there at some point and, and sit down and record with you then Good. too. But um, I guess as a, a sort of last question that I okay. always bombard people with, and I usually warn them: What are you reading? Ah, uh, Tsitsi Dagaremga, uh, a novelist, woman novelist from Kenya, 
was recently fined and given a suspended sentence for something she wrote. Um, and uh, she's a really interesting writer. Um, I used to teach her first novel, Nervous Conditions. <coughs> it's about a woman in... Um, uh, well, actually, she's from Zimbabwe. Why did I say Kenya? Mm. I'll update it for the Yeah, she's from Zimbabwe. Um, a girl having an education she shouldn't have because her older brother happened to die. Mm-hmm. And it's you know very sort of searing portrait of this sort of tribal values colliding with Western ideas as sort of filter it through colonial possibilities. Mm-hmm. So, but it's a very fierce and intelligent book. So, um, extracurricular reading, or is that a, sorry? Is that extracurricular no, reading? Or I, I may try to write about her. Yeah, I read Lucy Sant's Reservoirs, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm reading uh, Ian McEwan's Lessons, and Wesley Brown, Red and Blue. Yeah, and uh, I don't have all these open at the same time. You know? okay. Finish two of them. I, I sometimes have to with, with, <laughs> with juggling the show. I, I really like only having one book at a time, but I'm caught right now in a. Yeah, there are three people okay, I need to so record three, with. But, yes. you know. I have two. What do you hope to read? What do I want to read next? Yeah. Well, what's the thing you're thinking? God damn it, I've never gotten to. Kennedy's journals. Yeah? I sort of always have put them off. And then I was thinking, well, why? And it turned out we had we've had them all these years. Um, and the Hazlitt, you know, there's more Hazlitt I'd like to read. Um, I think when you're buffeted by your own time, sometimes stepping out and consulting a voice from the past helps you to. Not make sense. Know what to look for. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, not make sense exactly, but... To know what to look for and to put yourself in the stream of history, Hmm. you know, and it gives you some humility about your perspective. You sounded... Plenty humble throughout about about you know who you are and where things stand, but you know I know in the overarching narcissism that both of us have. Nonetheless, we try and play it off as no, Thank no, you. I'm just a failure. You know, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the other you know. uh, great last question uh, to make you feel even worse, uh, besides the the key to all mythologies, what else do you hope to write? Uh, do you feel? Um, uh, well, in addition to <laughs> I'm using getting that rid as a, of this shorthand but... contract, this sort of history of. It can't be a history of black literature. This work on black literature in the 20th century that I owe and that I would like to publish in some form. Uh, And maybe a collection of other pieces not necessarily having to do with um, politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyway, much more with culture. Um, I went to South Carolina for the first time in my life in around Easter, after Easter. I met the first white Pinckney I've ever met, a 94-year-old woman named Dorothy Pinckney Gans on Pinckney Colony in Beaufort, South Carolina. <clears throat> and uh, both my aunts had gone to boarding school there at the Cotton Mather School, which I learned has nothing to do with Cotton Mather. It's for yeah. a woman who, a widow named Mather, uh, started these schools. It's a weird coincidence or a weird Isn't thing it? not to be aware of when you're naming the place, but, but cool. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, and, you know, looking for the emancipation tree, sort of great oak. Um, and the reason so many people came to Beaufort to hear the Emancipation Proclamation read was um, if you didn't hear it, then maybe you weren't free, so you had to get within the sound of... Okay. Uh, and this scene is my contribution to the 1619 Project, but I wrote it from reading books, not from getting there. So 
I'm trying to find a way to find where my forebearers had been enslaved uh, because there were a lot of Pinckneys and they held a lot of land throughout an area of the low country going towards sort of Georgia. And uh, I know where my family was after the Civil War because they were part of a group that founded a town called Promised Land, South Carolina, which is sort of very far from the lowlands where they had been enslaved. But finding them in slavery, I, I haven't... Yeah. I've only just started. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to do that somehow, uh, to take advantage of the records that are now available. You can even online, I've figured out in these... <clears throat> they have, they've published the contraband contracts with the Union Army and just the repetitions of certain names in the family. I think that this is my great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, or... Uh, I found, you know, an on, online affidavits, and it's his, it's, yeah, great, great, somebody's, you know, name, but you can see the X, maybe he couldn't write, yeah, things like that. Uh, so there is a history of promised land in South Carolina that I'm kind of using as a guide to try to find where. Uh, and so as far back I think I've gotten is... Uh, the town of Abbeville, Georgia, in 1761, had a lot of Huguenots. And there's a sort of... <clears throat> my great-great-great-grandmother on... I don't know, anyway, has it one of these names that makes it easy to trace where they all came from, because it's one of these Huguenot names. Hmm. Uh, so we'll see what all this comes to. Could turn into the perspective third novel, if it involves mm. imagining what those histories were, if there's too it many It depends options. on how much I find and don't. Yeah. If I don't find enough. Happy or glad that you uh, weren't in London for the the queue for Queen Elizabeth's death, et cetera? Or, you know. Well, I wrote about it. I know. Yeah. Well, you know. You were here, though, writing about it. Yes. I mean... Uh, Marina went to the funeral, but she couldn't see anything in the Abbey. So yeah. television was a great seat. And uh, uh, it was an, an amazing thing, an amazing moment. Um, I think it's surprising everyone how carrying on they are. Uh, when Liz Truss said, therefore, I have spoken to His Majesty the King, I thought, oh, Right, he is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, James said she killed the queen, <laughs> <laughs> but they did her in too. So, no, so, uh, yeah. no but uh, we'll see. It's very disappointing for politicians to have these very small, petty uh, considerations and reactions, given the enormities of what we're being faced with. But this is what we always say. But it's more and more and more true. I think after the Democrats get through, I'm going to become green because it's the only thing that, you know, yeah. projects a future. I mean, for Liz Trust to introduce legislation about drilling in the North Sea and fracking in Norfolk, it's just yeah. going backwards, not the answer. It's just like here where it's about, you know, surfing up meat for the, the, the base. But... <sighs> it's going to do us in. Yeah. You know? Which is why we should both be glad we don't have kids. So. You don't have kids? No, no. <laughs> Again, when we talk about narcissism and selfishness. Yeah, really. You have to wake up every day and like someone better than Another yourself. Another human being? <laughs> I know. I'm, I can't make that promise to kids. And, uh, <laughs> you know. No. But Gerald, thanks so much for coming on. I'm glad we got to do this in person well, this thank time. thank you very and, much. And uh, it's always a great pleasure. And uh, uh, I'm very touched by your interest and that you wanted to that you asked to do this. So very happy to do it. And hello to everyone. And once again, on my list goes 
a new graphic novelist. Uh, this I, is the Scots guy. I, I keep opening you. Oh yeah, Tom Gold. I keep yeah, opening yeah. you up to, to yeah. you know great guests of mine. So yeah, I know. That's sort of what I'm here for is to well, try to, to. There's a separate stack in my room. It's like you know Gill's people. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, so thanks very much. much. And that was Daryl Pinkney. His new memoir from FSG, Come Back in September, A Literary Education on West 67th Street, Manhattan, it really is a wonder. Um, like I said, it's a very different literary New York City than other Golden Age memoirs and, and remembrances I've read. I would say it's because he's a different man, a different writer, and it's a little different time. But it's just occurring to me in this moment, and it's based on stuff that Daryl had talked about. Partly it's because he's writing about the women, um, about Hardwick, Barbara Epstein, Susan Sontag, and others. And a lot of the other writers I've mentioned tend to write about the male literary figures of, of their New York. So, duh. Okay, that's part of it. Anyway, this book really is majestic. Um, so if you care about literary culture, if you care about, you know, what it once felt like to be in the room with legends, warts and all, um, I really hope you give this one a read come back in September. You should also check out my 2020 conversation with Daryl and go pick up the collections we talked about then, uh, Busted in New York and Blackballed. Someday I will get around to reading his novels. He actually laughed when I mentioned not having read Black Deutschland yet, but um, I hope to get around to that. And then next time we talk, I'll, I'll have a fuller idea of who Daryl is as a writer. Now, uh, he also mentioned that he has no social media presence. And as we know, that's for the best. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories show by telling other people about it. Uh, let them know there's this podcast comes out every week with really interesting conversations with uh, cultural figures, writers, artists, etc. And, um, well, you, you can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or music or piece of theater or art exhibition, whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by uh, sending me an email, sending me a postcard. I love postcards. I send a postcard out every single day, um, which has been my 2022 resolution, and it's been fantastic so far. Um, you can also leave a message on my Google voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. Um, and messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you go longer than that, call back and, and leave the rest of your message. And let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might say something interesting to our, our listeners that we'd love to share that, that I would love to share, but I would never do that without your approval. So um, let me know if that would be cool. Now, if you've got uh, money to spare, yeah, don't give it to me. Um, I mean, you can as a, a nice gesture, but really, I'm just going to give it away to other artists and writers, which is what I hope you would do. Help individuals or institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Topato Go, Crowdfunder, and, and other crowdfunding platforms. And, and if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, um, I give to my local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, targeted election funds, um, there are other things you can do. Freedom funds, Planned Parenthood and abortion funds. Um, well, there are all sorts of things you can do to, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, 
and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs>